Hello, and welcome to today's skill up session from DevOps Institute and PeopleSert, powered by TechStrong. I'm your host, Donna Knapp, and today's topic is ITIL practice guides, taking your service management journey forward. On our panel today, we have Mache Jarash, Ryan Holzer, and Robin Boiza. Welcome to everyone. Before we get started, I just want to say that the session is live and being recorded, so you'll be able to listen to it again on demand. Also, there are chat and Q&A features on the right side of your screen that you can use to communicate amongst yourself in the audience or with our panelists, and we hope you'll have some great questions for us. So let's start with some introductions. Thank you again to our panelists. And if each of you could take a minute to introduce yourself, let's start out with Maché. Of course. Hi, Maché here. Uh, personally, personally, professionally, I would say, I work as a consultant and DevOps Institute ITIL trainer. I guess that I can also title myself as a writer because I also create content for different courses. Yeah, I, I like to think of myself as a writer. <laughs> And I like mathematics and statistics, so I can pass the microphone to whoever is there next. So, Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Thank you. Yes, my name is Robin, and I am a senior change manager, and I work on process development as well as improving operationally day to day and figuring out our metrics so we can prove our value and continually improve. Excellent. Thank you. Ryan? Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan. I am an IT service management consultant. I uh, also do ITIL4 foundation training. So yeah, a lot of consulting work at the time. Not so much the training world. So uh, yeah, happy to be here, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. So audience, you probably figured out we have some different perspectives here. Uh, we have someone who primarily serves in a consulting role, someone who's an educator, someone who's a practitioner, probably like many of you, right? And, and, and maybe you play all of these roles. So I wanna very quickly just explain that PeopleCert has done entire webinars about the idle practice guides. Um, we're not gonna repeat any of that. We're gonna talk about how to use the practice guides. But first, the very short, a uh, backstory in terms of how the practice guides came to be. Historically in IDLE, the, what we called processes in previous versions of IDLE were actually part of the core publications of the IDLE framework. And with IDLE 4, the practices got pulled out and they got put into guides. And we'll talk about, Ryan actually, we'll talk about what those guides look like. And they are now maintained online in a subscription service called Maxilos. And the reason is so that they could be adapted more quickly. The IT world is changing so quickly. Ways of working are, are constantly changing. Increasingly, Idle is integrating with other ways of working, Agile, DevOps, Site Reliability, Engineering, Value Stream Management, right? Mm -hmm. and so by having the practice guides be standalone documents that are maintained online, they're able to use Agile, right? And, and, and adjust them more quickly when they need to, as opposed to going through a traditional public publishing life cycle, which can take a year. So that's a little bit of the backstory on the practice guides. So let's talk first of all about using the practice guides. So, Ryan, can I have you start off? And actually, Robin, I'm going to have you start off while, while mm -hmm. we're getting Ryan's image back. Um, can you start off by talking about the practice guides and, and, and how you're using them in your organization? Yes, thank you. I actually, I print mine out, first of all, um, but I do mm -hmm. have to constantly make sure it's up to date, obviously. Um, I use them to just help guide. I never, I think I initially thought that they would be the answer, right? Open up the book and it's a plug and play, follow all the, all the details step-by-step step and boom, you're going to have this magic change management process practice that is stellar. Um, it's not like that. 
So <laughs> had to change my expectations on the book a little bit. But yeah. what I can do is start where I am, right? And realize what I have and identify what I need from an offering value standpoint from what my stakeholders are looking for. And then I reference that book and it helps guide me with some great examples and suggestions on different ways. And knowing that you don't have to exactly stick to the book, um, but you can adapt and, and adopt what you need right. has been very helpful. So I yeah. went from wanting, expecting a full blown package deal to appreciating that it's not so specific and right. using what I need. Yep. Thank you. Ryan, what about you? How are you using them? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that, you know, ITIL is and always has been just a set of best practices. And, mm -hmm. you know, from the, 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 the debate of it being prescriptive or non-prescriptive, it's really not prescriptive in the sense that the practice guides have to be followed from A to Z. Like Robin was saying, it's reference material, it's a guide. And so depending on the maturity of your organization, I see many different levels of maturity in the consulting practices and in some of the corporations that I've been in. But it serves as that reference guide. If you're if you're starting to deploy practices or improving existing practices, the guides are there to give you that reference point mm -hmm. for the different practices to be able to go to, rather than having to go through some of the course material or the publications that are listed. The guides are listed in the way that it talks about the purpose, it talks about the practice success factors, and they're really centered around the four dimensions. And so you can go through and understand mm -hmm. if you need KPIs or need metrics, you can go right to that section and understand it. I always have them up just as, like I said, a reference standpoint when I'm working or planning assessments or organizing for you know, discussions or different initiatives or business cases, whatever it may be, job descriptions. Those guides, all of them, they're always easily referenceable for me. So I have that and I can jump to them as needed. Right. Amache, what about you? Sure. Um, I see those practices as a set of bricks, let's say, set of tools. Like you have those Lego bricks. You have different pieces and elements. You can build whatever you like from them. This is a good starting point, for example, risk management practice. Um, for some people that will be basic, well, it depends on their experience with risk management because they are not talking about aleatory, epistemic, etc., different uncertainties, but it's a good starting point. You have some diagrams, you have some ideas where to start, and actually you can build up on that. So uh, from this point of view, yeah, I, I prefer to do it this way. Yeah. And <laughs> about pre prescriptive versus descriptive. You know, some things in life are prescriptive, let's say, like bookkeeping. If you do creative bookkeeping, you go to jail. <laughs> but this is not this is not prescriptive in this case. So you, you do not need to. Right. You actually should focus on thinking. And I, that, that actually kind of segues to my next question, because one of the things I personally think is really interesting about the business world and the IT industry in particular today is organizations are all over the place. You know, some organizations still have a central IT department and some organizations have, um, you know, embedded IT in their business units. Some organizations have product, cross-functional product oriented teams. And so you really can't have a one size fits all approach to doing things, even within your own organization you may have one part of your organization using Waterfall and one part of your use organization using Agile and DevOps. And so can I ask each of you, and I'm, I'm going to just circle back to Mate this time and let you start off because you started the conversation. You know, how have you been able to use the practice guides to in different environments and in different situations where organizations really do have um, are, are leveraging lots of different frameworks and lots of different ways of working. Uh, sure. I would say it's great to, to have this greenfield type of situation because you can introduce uh, something that is working actually. But when you come to, I think it's called brownfield, the, the old one, uh, the old uh, environment where you can actually go into. Uh, so uh, I've seen that some 
organizations have this problem that they have a set of practices. They are fossilized, so to say. You cannot change anything because it, it's it's such there's such a complexity that if you would change just one element, everything will blow up. It's it's this level of of, of a mess, I would say. So, uh, yeah, that, that that's a good that's a good question. How to move from such a situation to to a new one? But uh, how to use those practices? Well, I would I like to start with training because from that we can settle up on a dictionary of terms. So incident means incident, problem means problem, and not 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 a situation where people would would be using the same words with different meaning. That's that's also a mess. And yeah, and I've lost the video. I I think. Um, what else? I think I would like to chime in later when I will remember more. Yeah. And. I'll, I'll just refresh. Okay. Robin, how about you? Yes. So we have different areas, different departments that will have, you know, just like he said, different definitions, even for an incident, what makes an incident, what makes a change. And mm -hmm. it is, for me, I found it is about standard definition and education. So I kind of, again, start where I am, right? So I like to start with the most, I guess, compliant or the, the, the one area that seems to do the best with, be the closest to the ITIL standards. And starting there, really set that definition and that grow that process, how they will be implementing changes. And then you can slowly introduce it to others. You can say, you know, this is, this is what it changes and look at how this team is doing it. Look at how successful they are. Look at the value that we were able to bring. And I think once you can prove your own success and prove the value, then you can slowly get other teams on board. But at the same time, they're not going to all do things the same way for right. a million and one different reasons. Um, not everybody can do can do it exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So you again, you just have to adapt by keeping the same standards in place. Just adapt right. how they are done by each group. Right. right. But it you can, know, Robin. Robin and I share the fact that we're Robin is now a change manager. I was a change manager at one point in my career. And I have to say, when I was first um, learning about DevOps and I came in from that lens of being a change manager, I thought it was just crazy, stuff, crazy talk um, because they weren't following you know, change management. And when I finally wrapped my head around what they were doing and all the practices that have been put in place in DevOps, mitigate risk and minimize impact if something goes wrong mm -hmm. um i kind of went oh okay and really it, it was probably the first time that i realized the need to have two different versions of a practice two different flavors of a process within our organization and just for anybody who hasn't looked at them in idle for the change enablement practice guide actually has like two columns Here's how you would do it in a traditional, somewhat manual way. Here's how you would do it in a highly automated environment where you've got DevOps and CI/CD. So it's a cool, it's a cool aspect of the practice guides that they are acknowledging that that we live in different worlds now. Absolutely, and that uh, that column breakdown was very helpful. How about you, Ryan? Adapt to a different environment. Re reiterate that question. I was refreshing so, as I lost video. You know, organizations have different environments today. Some organizations are still doing traditional waterfalls. Some have agile DevOps, and you have to adapt your practices accordingly, right? So have you found the guidance, and are you able to use the guidance uh, in order to adapt to different environments? Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's that's the one thing to be mindful of is the only constant is change in our environments and being able to have the practice guides, it, it affords the companies to adapt and adopt what they need depending on the pace of change or the patterns of business activity in the environment. And so it's highly adaptable in that perspective. And then once they understand where they're headed and where they want to be, that planning phase of you've, you've adapted it, now how do you adopt it and move forward? So very flexible in that perspective. And without the practice guides, I think 
my job would be much more difficult because I would spend that much more time preparing and trying to understand and just reacquainting myself, maybe with some of the practices that I don't talk about all that often, strategy management, mm -hmm. architecture, you know, financial. So having that as a resource, it plugs and plays into these organizations, regardless of if they're waterfall or agile. Uh, it's a good fit all around. And yeah. it, it works really well being able to have that information at your fingertips. Right. Yes. Right. You know, um, those columns or those different ways of doing things, also a lot of times I find, you know, initially people, Maché used the word fossilized, right? They kind of have this firmly entrenched view of how to do things. Um, so have you been able to use the practice guides to shift the way people think, maybe to help them understand new ways of working and you know why those new ways of working really require that we adapt our existing processes or and you know, if nothing else, continue to improve our processes. And the, and also like there's a little part um uh, B in this, you know, have you ever had a good debate based around kind of these two different ways of approaching these processes? And what does that look like? You know, how can you use the information in the practice guides to, to facilitate that? Right. So, Robin, let me come back to you to start that conversation, because, again, change is one of those hotly debated <laughs> topics. And yes. and I think one where we ha do in the modern world have to shift the way we think about that practice. So let me come to you first. It is very hotly debated on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things that I had to learn was from a version four gener general mm -hmm. four standpoint, um, ITIL is not black and white. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a hard thing to accept. And I had a wonderful uh, director who spent countless hours beating that into me. So once I accepted, it's it's not uh, it's not black and white. And to embrace the gray, I think was a, a lot that he used to say. That really helped me see the different ways and open my eyes to how we can do it for, you know, for our stakeholders, how we can put it in mm -hmm. place and reduce a lot of the conflict and arguments, right? So when you accept the fact that there are 10 different ways to do it, and they're all acceptable, they're all good, um, and really focus on what are the minimum requirements, right? Do we meet, can we meet our audit requirements? Can we, can we reduce as much risk as possible and get this thing to the customer successfully? and reduce that outage time, right? So when you focus on what you need to do, um, it kind of allows you to bend a little bit and accept the different ways of doing things. Right. So that's been very helpful for me as far as trying to set up and mm -hmm. deploy that practice and the ideas across different teams. Right. And, you know, I asked Robin about um, change enablement, right? Because it is kind of hotly debated. But, you know, I'm going to, and I'm mm -hmm. going to come to Mate with this because, Mate, you're a DevOps and Institute investor as well. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in the DevOps world, problem management is hotly debated, right? You know, the whole concept of root cause analysis is, Don Willis mm -hmm. and I recently did a whole webinar about that. Um, it's one of those hotly debated topics as well. So, so what do you find living in both the IT service management and DevOps worlds about, you know, how we have discussions and debates about these practices mm -hmm. and how can we leverage the practice guides in order to facilitate those conversations? Sure. I would say that technology right now is running at such a great pace that people are actually lost within the technology. We have more possibilities than we imagined, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. So this is actually crazy. Look, we have AI, we have observability, etc. We have so much data and yet not so much time to process that data. So we need some kind of framework. That's how I see it. And here, th those practice guides are a good framework to, to have a discussion around. Because, for example, if we would like to do a root, root cause analysis, that, that's a very basic technique, of course. There are, there are better ones, I think. But, okay, we have data. 
we have something that happened and now we need to connect those those dots basically so this uh this practice guide definitely helps with with connecting those dots and understanding that we don't have to reinvent the wheel there you know there is a methodical way of doing it um and Pretty much. You know, right you can you, you, you know you can adapt that but you don't have to start you mm -hmm. know from scratch Brian, what about you yeah you know from from a, a higher level in the organization uh being able to use the guides to talk about organizational change management not change management from the products and service perspective but the people side of change and how important it is for the leadership teams to embrace that change and manage that change and really drive the change through the organizations because a lot of the initiatives that we all work on it's not just centered excuse me it's not just centered in it it's that larger focus it's that digital strategy focus that enterprise service management it could reach out to different different areas of the organization and so being able to talk to the leadership teams about this to get them understand and get them encouraged to support these initiatives and drive forward with it i think a lot of times a lot of times the work that we're doing gets looked at as projects you know and not so much programs or larger organizational change <laughs> perspectives and so having that guide to walk me through what's needed from a leadership point of view to guide leadership and to have leadership stand up because mm -hmm. from what i've seen donna in a lot of the organizations leadership's there but it's more of a management it's not a leadership perspective and so having these guides there's there's great points in there about practice success factors if you're going to deploy organizational change management what are the two or three things that i need to convey to those teams so they understand and they're on board and there's excitement for what we're doing and we can push forward you know further on into the guides you know you get into maybe the information and technology section of the guides sure. talking about different metrics and measurements and how those extrapolate up into indicators maybe a long term if it's six month and nine month type of project mm -hmm. i want to know indications per quarter are we going to meet that goal or not and so those kpis that are listed in there they may be acceptable for the organization and they may not but it opens the conversation to start to at least have to have the discussion and if there's debate there great that's that's the debate I want because I want the teams talking and I want them understanding. And so using these guides to influence from that perspective has been very helpful from an OCM perspective. And Robin, that's something you and I talked about. You use the practice guides for to identify your metrics, yes? Yes. So starting with those practice success factors, breaking it down and just understanding what I should be looking at, right? How what what do you measure to prove the value that you bring? Um, I use it for designing those types of metrics, but also reference it from other metric types that aren't necessarily process driven. Um, understanding if something is I guess, um, following the process in general, right? So it's not just process success, but it's also understanding process adherence and mm -hmm. what it takes to measure that because that's just as important. Right, right. It's, um, you know, you're never really going to be able to fully measure a process until it's being followed consistently to right. some extent, right? And then you right. can get a good, you know, a good baseline on how it's performing. So it's it's always painful for organizations, especially if people are unhappy with a new process that's been implemented. You always want to keep tweaking it, but at some point you have to try to stabilize it so that you can get a good baseline and then know, let's use the Deming plan, do check that cycle, right? you know, let's study the results of how it's performing and then kind of go from there. Mate, what about you in terms of digging out metrics and using it to help organizations measure and improve their performance? Oh, of course, I love metrics. Yeah. <laughs> they are related to numbers. <laughs> I've started to love numbers. Um, yes. Uh, by reading those practice guides, at least those that you're interested in, 
So let, let's focus maybe on problem management. What you can measure? You can measure cardinal numbers. Those are those are, are actually meaningful metrics. So time, money, etc. Quantity of something within one category, because you do not want to compare apples to oranges. That's that's pointless. Um, so um, I don't know what else to add. To be honest, yeah. I, I would need to talk about a specific example. So, yeah. So w w when it comes to problem management, we can of course count number of problems per quota of time. We can. Uh, well, we can measure impact of those problems when it comes to monetary value or equivalent. We can count lost opportunities. We can count the time between problems, the time to identify a problem, you know, time to fix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the problem management practice guide is a really good example of one where they, they have like a whole little section in the practice guide that talks about how to um, use metrics for all intents and purposes to justify your problem management practice and show um, what it's achieved. And it and it's all in, to Ryan's point, it's all about talking to leadership about have we mitigated risks? Have mm -hmm. we helped improve productivity? Have we helped to minimize the impact of incidents? Have we helped to improve the user experience, right? And those are the kinds of things that leadership cares about. So there really is some good language mm -hmm. in the practice guides and in in the in the case of what we're talking about here in problem management that, that that's really useful there. And you know, it, you reminded me much when I was a young consultant, um, mm -hmm. my mentor used to always have to used to always tell me talk about beans and dollars, right? <laughs> so numbers counting stuff and and, and and dollars, that's that that's the way we we, we have to communicate. Um, and Ryan, what about you? We, we, you know, you. I know you're a mentor, and he always talks about value, outcomes, costs, and risks, right? Um, you know, talking to leadership about, um, you know, how do we measure this stuff, and how do we demonstrate proof of concept, and what do you get when you can demonstrate proof of concept? Yeah, I think having having those measurements in place, having the teams understand what they're measuring having that flow up into metrics and then ultimately into KPIs. And then at that higher level, critical success factors of what do those teams, what do those practices need to do to call themselves successful? Mm -hmm. And if you reference back to version three, continual service improvement, the vision, the measurements hierarchy, you know, it's been, it's been improved upon and now I think it's cascading objectives. But the point is at that lower levels, you're gonna define it down and measure it going up that ladder to the point where not only can you validate what your practices are doing, but it's the validate, direct, justify, and intervene using those measurements, using that information, not only to say, are my practices successful and did we get there and how do we keep a lot of this momentum going, but at that higher level to these executives, because that's the all important component that mm -hmm. ITIL 4 is starting to touch on now, not starting to, but you know, since they released the material several years ago, there's that understanding that at that leadership level, we need to validate and we need to justify these practices. And how do I do that? And especially from a consulting standpoint, with the engagements that I'm part of, you only have a certain amount of time. And so driving those measurements or that success in the organization is critical. And so, like I said, there's more than just the validation and the justify. It's, it's also directing the teams, allowing them to fluctuate as the time goes because we have indicators we need to be at x by the end of q2 we're at the end of q1 and we're nowhere near there so what do we need to shift and then intervening getting into the teams it's it's rarely just an it issue it could be more expansive if you think of that whole value stream through the organization maybe those metrics and a lot of those indicators and a lot of this to pull back to the practice guides a lot of this information is embedded in there as just some of those high level metrics to start measuring or KPIs to start measuring. It's not the end all be all, but at least it gives you a starting point to, to move from. Right. I think it's important, you know, again, we talked about metrics, you know, using those metrics to prove your success and, you know, are we meeting that value and are we doing what we said we would do um, from a process adherence standpoint, but also using the metrics to identify areas of improvement. So that's mm -hmm. really, a huge benefit, I think, um, you know, if you can say, yes, our changes are successful, mm -hmm. 
you're still there's still room for improvement, right? If you have a metric that can identify it took me X amount of time to revert or to even identify the issue, right? So that's what I look at is how long before that incident started from that change? Why did it take too long? You know, why did it take five hours to identify that there was a failure? And when you start categorizing those reasons for that longer time frame, you can understand, oh, we don't have an alert or an alarm in place, or there was nobody doing testing, right? So those are all areas for the practice to improve upon. So it's another way to use those metrics. Right. And I think that's one of the things that Idle 4 has really brought to this conversation is that idea of value stream thinking, understanding mm -hmm. that no one practice stands alone. Mm -hmm. Robin, you just, in the course of that little conversation, I heard monitoring event management, I heard mm -hmm. incident, I heard problem, I heard change, right? Um, and so even if your focus is on proving incident management, you can use the practice guides to learn a little bit more about problem or monitoring and event management. Mate, I saw you nodding your head when 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 she was talking. Yes. So, do, do you find that, um, and and especially with Idle Four, that you've been able to uh, your conversations about how to integrate practices in the impact of one practice on another have you been able to pro progress forward with those types of conversations mm, i haven't Especially, had those conversations to be honest i'm sorry i haven't you had don't. such conversations <clears throat> because you um, know, one of, go no, ahead please. i'm sorry no please don't not please no, I was going to say one of the kind of reports that have been around for whatever, 14, 15 years is the state of DevOps report and the four mm -hmm. core metrics that we measure in DevOps. Yes. And I remember looking at them for the first time and thinking these are IT service management metrics. So, you know, change lead time, you know, time to restore when incidents occur, change failure rate, you know, deployment frequency. Um, at the end of the day, they're all tied to... Um, they're tied to IT service management practices. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I think in the DevOps community in particular, I always say to them, you're doing these practices. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you just might not be calling it, but you're doing it. Yes. Um, one of the things, you know, a little bit back, I had this fleeting thought and, and, and we were talking about something else, but let's, Let's spend a minute talking about um, these practice success factors because it's come up a few times. This is something new that's been introduced in the Idle 4 practice guides. The practice success factors are tied to the new Idle 4 capability uh, model that you can use to assess the capability or what we would have maybe historically called the maturity of your practices. And they are all of the practice guides have been refreshed kind of within this year to add in capability criteria and, and, and the capability level. So if you are if you have an old version of a practice guide stored mm -hmm. on your computer somewhere, you're actually not going to be finding that information. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to ask you all, you know, are you how are you using the practice guides to assess the maturity? So, Brian, why don't you? lead off on that. Yeah, yeah, great example for that, Donna, is Service Desk. A lot of organizations, like you, you were saying, they, they have some semblance of practices just because they have products or services that they're delivering to customers, right? And so from a Service Desk perspective, I'll give you a great example. Looking at the practice success factors for Service Desk, it's single point of contact and are you capturing demand for requests and incidents? Mm -hmm. Starting from that perspective to have discussions with the teams, giving them a reference to say, you know, guys, from a service desk perspective, are we at least doing this from a practice? Yes or no. That opens up an incredible amount of opportunities to start making improvements or start planning what that project or program needs to do. And that's similar for all the different practices, you know, having those practice success factors, because it gives you it gives you the purpose of, of where that practice needs to head. Uh, is it too expansive? Is it not expansive enough to cover what it needs to cover once you get into the rest of the guide and looking at the different dimensions of value streams and processes and the Oregon people, information technology and partners and suppliers? 
once you start going through this, you may find that your service desk team has other responsibilities that maybe should be moved to other teams or the opposite. Other teams have those responsibilities that you could shift left to the service right. desk. And so, but you need to understand what that, I always like to start with why and why does this practice exist? And those practice, or, or, I'm sorry, the uh, practice success factors, they do a great job of pointing you in that direction to say, at least consider this and this. And they're typically they're only two or three you know, just they're not very detailed. They shouldn't be very simple. Just things to keep in mind as you start talking about those practices. And especially when you're talking about multiple mm -hmm. service desk, incident, change, problem, understanding those PSFs really sets you into being able to, you know, I hate to use the word silo, but whenever you're, whenever you're talking about the different practices and ensuring that responsibilities and rules, you know, the different rules and responsibilities, you have that information at your fingertips. And yeah. like I said, the, the, the whole theme of this is having that referenceable information that these guys provide. And that's, that's the key because you need to know where to go to get this information. If you can pull it down in PDFs or in other type of document management, all the better because you're gonna be going to these guides on and off just as refreshers or guidance or to help you plan. And the PSFs do a great job of that as you get into each practice. Right. Matei, what about you? Are you using the guides to do capability assessments with your clients? Um, I'm using the capability maturity model that we actually customize for every client. Um, because now I have found those in, in those idle practice guides. Um, well, I've been using older practice guides from uh, 2020, so I haven't heard about this one. This is crazy. But still, CMM is CMM, so that's that. Um, yes, you actually, this is a pyramid model, let's say. You need to have foundation, then you go level up and up, up to the point that, well, ideally, your practice would be self self-repairing and self-improving so it, it needs to have i don't know how to say it, it needs to be self-conscious <laughs> basically so that's interesting so using data to kind of monitor performance and then mm -hmm. adapt uh, accordingly uh yes of course because i would say it, it's a repeatable process you start with not knowing what's going on then you set some boundaries so that people can actually have some kind of relation to what's going on. Then you start measuring stuff. Then you start automating measurements that, that you have. And then you analyze this data. And then you build more and more automation up to the point that maybe you'll remove the manual part. And Donna, from uh, to, to build on MJ's perspective, if you have new practices that you are standing up mm -hmm. and you want to consider those maturity models, well, those maturity models, they list out just on a general scale, what the capabilities are for the organization or for your teams that you need to consider. And so mm -hmm. where else are you going to find that information? You know, it's difficult to find that at, at a moment's notice. If, you're, if mm -hmm. you're trying to plan out new practices and, you know, let's say you're building out a business case. Well, understanding rules, responsibilities, here are the capabilities that I need yes. for each dimension. I mean, it, it does a tremendous job of, of giving you that information just as a jump start to help you start planning things. Right. Robin, what about you? I like to use it. Um, I reference it to kind of get an idea of where I am, right? Where is my process currently? And then I think it helps give me an idea of next steps to take and areas that I can focus on. So if I do need that, you know, mm -hmm. an idea of, what else can I be doing and try to keep it in the back of my mind where I want to be. Right. Um, I think it uh, helps give me some guidance there. Right. And you were sharing with me, you take the capability criteria, put it into it. I like to put it into an Excel file. Yeah. So I can kind of score myself or check things off and keep track. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it just helps me identify what's next. You know, anytime you're doing capability assessments, that idea of scoring is always an interesting conversation because you could give the criteria to 10 people. And Robin, what happens when you, you give it to the different answers? <laughs> yeah. Are we doing it or are we not? Right. right. Um, and that's so, okay. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand what does it mean for our company, right? So mm -hmm. 
it's going to mean something different everywhere you go. But here, this is what it means. And I like to say this is what this is this is the value that it shows, you know, in the book. And this is how we translate it. So I like to keep that translation mm -hmm. of how I defined it here. Um, I like to keep track of that. Right. And you said what's important to our company, um, you know, maturity is one of those things where, you know, there's this misperception that you have to get all your practices to maturity level five, and that would cost a ridiculous amount of money in, in most organizations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ryan, how are you talking to your clients about, you know, what is the right maturity level? You know, maturity should be used for two reasons, to continually improve or to, you know, again, set priorities based mm -hmm. on the needed capabilities for your organization. So how are you kind of having those those conversations? Those conversations happen, Donna, with, again, going back to OCM and introducing this concept to the executive teams. First and foremost, understanding their vision. What's that aspiration of what the company is doing? And then how does that, how does that uh, flow down into the different business strategy? Do they even have a digital strategy or just an IT strategy? what level of maturity is the organization at and where do they want to be? And more importantly, is the funding there, you know, to be able to get to where they want to be going back to the VOCR, you know, there's outcomes that they want to achieve, but the costs and risks are those acceptable to the organization? Is there that consideration? And so that's kind of the perspective of, you know, understanding that aspiration, the why message, and then pulling that down. Once you understand that, then you can start applying the, the practice guides to the journey and where they need to be and, and how they're gonna get there. I think once you understand the why, the what and the how of what they need to do starts to fall in place with everyone's perspective. Right. Mache, I see you nodding your head. Right? Yes, of course. Right because I, I'm thinking, I of course agree with all, with all of you. I, I see things a bit differently. Maturity is not, it's, it's not like a level in a video game that once you get to level 100, you win the game. <laughs> it, it, it's not like that in reality. Well, I can compare that to bodybuilding, let's say. Okay, you have the posture of, of Arnold Schwarzenegger and what? You win life, yeah? <laughs> not really. So I would say maturity is like a benchmark. So those models are benchmarks. You can compare your current state to some kind of benchmark, well, ideal results, so to say. You can, of course, compare yourself to yourself over time. So you make a snapshot of your current state. And then let's say quarter later, three months later, you compare your current state to, to the previous state. So it depends on whether you would like to be proactive or reactive in this case. But uh, it's good to have those distilled benchmarks that you can compare yourself. Uh, maybe we can call them industry standards, at least in some industries. Uh, and maybe they are just uh, like a wild west. I mean, the, well, they are they are innovative in, in some industries, so that they are still being built. But still, it's good to have this set of data that you can actually do something with. Because right. otherwise, it's, it's like this. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, you cannot risk big dollars on that. And, and you don't have anything to base learning on. You know, I, I would say... You know, Deming always preferred plan, mm -hmm. do, study act, right? Because mm -hmm. he said you should study. Whether you didn't hit your target or not, or you did hit your target, study. If you didn't hit your target, why was that? What can we learn from that? If we did hit the target, what can we learn from that? How can we scale it? How can we mm -hmm. expand that success? So, um, yeah, it just it kind of gives you something you can use to learn and to have a... Mm -hmm fact-based conversation around. Yeah, I would like to add that, okay, organizations are of different types. You can have companies that want to earn money. You can, you can have some charities that want to, I don't know, help people because they, they do not, you know, make money to, to buy stuff. They just make money to give that money to some other people or, or just uh, do some services to them, like helping. Um, so yeah, depending on your focus, you still use those different practices and you can still use those benchmarks to compare your health uh, health status. Yeah. Right. yeah. 
So I don't, I'm not seeing any questions yet. So I just want to remind the audience, you can send in questions for us. We're up for it. We can handle it. So uh, remember that if you want to post a question, please go ahead and do so. Um, I kind of want to talk about a subject that, you know, historically when we talked about practices and processes, uh, there's this old adage, no tools before the rules, right? But in today's day and age, we have to leverage technology, right? We have, you know, and, and I think Ryan mentioned the practice guides are organized around the four dimensions of service management, value streams and processes, organizations and people, partners and suppliers, and last but not least, information and technology. So I, I'd like to kind of have you all talk to you how are you able to leverage the practice guides and the idle, you know, information about the idle practices to support tool implementations? Um, mm -hmm. I know as an education company, a lot of times people are coming to our training classes because they're getting ready to introduce a service management tool. And so they, they want to learn the practices behind that. So Robin, how about you, you know, in terms of kind of whether it was maybe implementing a new tool or if you're if you're introducing a new practice, how do you kind of use that to support the tool implementation? And an example would be, you know, a lot of times these tools use terminology, right? Well, what does that terminology prioritize, right? What does that term mean? And can we use the practice guides to help educate people on kind of why we're doing this? I think if we're implementing, when we implement a new, like a new app or a new tool mm -hmm. to be used, well, you can use the, yeah. So obviously you're implementing something, right? So there will be changes involved. There may be releases involved. So using those practice guides, you can help educate the project people on how to follow or incorporate the ITIL practices in with the deployment of these new tools, the new software, the updates, the hardware um, mm -hmm. to help guide them on working together and not being so siloed. So I think it helps educate, again, on that terminology and how we can all work together to do that. Right. Ryan, what about you? Have you been involved in any initiatives where the organization was implementing a new tool and idle training was part of that conversation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not so much a new tool, but a new module within the tool, mm -hmm. standing mm -hmm. up service level management and getting to the point where they could start measuring their services. The guides were very helpful from that perspective of walking the teams through creating impact and urgency matrices, uh, getting to the point where they understood the services that they were providing, which is an entirely different discussion in and of itself. But walking through that process and ensuring that we are hitting each level of the four dimensions to be as thorough as possible so mm -hmm. we can stand up service level management. And then once we had all the rules in place, we could then take that to the development plan to the teams to start implementing so going that approach no tool before the yeah no tools before the rules you don't want a square peg round hole this type of thing it's got to go off it has to have buy-in through different teams and approval through the executive structure and so mm -hmm. being able to rely on the practice guides as how are we going to do this where do we want to be and how are we going to get there and then once you get to the point where you can start taking action and measuring that process Following these guides, there's there's um, uh, business model or, uh, process models rather inside of some of the guides that are very helpful. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can start using that information to talk about what are we doing and why is this necessary. And so, and then going back to the PSFs, you know, introducing it to the teams. Once everyone's on board, uh, projects like that, uh, they there's there's less of a chance of failure for that. Practice guides are not the end all be all in terms of everything. It's just a starting point, but it's a really good starting point. And introducing SLM into the organization and then tying that back into the tool, they're already doing some semblance of it, but it was highly disorganized. It was not providing the right information. 
it was aged uh, several years old. And so being able to do this and, and come up with the impact interesting matrices and tying that to surface level management and then and then taking it a step further and actually having this conversations of updating contracts or tying that to supplier management for the services that the suppliers are providing. It's kind of the flip of service level management. Right. Being able to use that information, you know, it knocked weeks off of what we needed to do as preparation. So yeah, very, very helpful of standing up that module in the tool. Right. And supplier man or service level management is, um, being discussed a lot lately um, in the context of experience management, right? The, you know, of understanding that the notion of watermelon SLAs where we've had these SLAs and everybody thinks all is well with the world, but we have this user community that is incredibly mm -hmm. unhappy with our, our products and services. So, um, you know, I was glad, very glad to see Idle 4 start to bring in some of that language from the experience community yeah. and challenge us to, 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 to be thinking about that as well. Yeah, and, um, and also, Donna, it's, okay. also, it's also good to see the progression of that thinking from version three into version four, and then some of the newer thought patterns going on and thought leadership of, you know, what you were talking about, the watermelon effect, where, you know, the metrics might say one thing, but the user experience says another. And so how do you address that? You know, and how do you how do you take the uh, experience level agreements and, and bring that into the discussion now? Because it's it's not just about the metrics, but it's about having those larger discussions. So, yeah, really glad to see that type of thought leadership coming into this thinking and and what we have all worked on over the years and seeing that things are improving and we're holding ourselves accountable to continual right. improvement as well with, with the uh, best practices. Yeah. So we have some questions. So I'm going to read Mario's mm -hmm. question and then I'd like you all to weigh in. So just jump in if you have thoughts. Um, perfect. Not to reinvent the wheel sounds good on process and matrix. Is there mm -hmm. any generic purpose template where to start from change management or contract management or supply management, et cetera? You find lots on internet, even idle process but none is fit for purpose or helps to tackle the issue at hand. All seems to me a theoretical approach, like an idea written on the sand. <laughs> so any, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, it's the proverbial, I see lots of information, but the bottom line is it depends. Um, and so how do I deal with that? So any of you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that touches back to, to something being prescriptive mm -hmm. and giving you, you know, as, as such, a, if you've done any type of like Sarbanes-Oxley compliance work where it is a checklist and you have to complete the checklist from A to Z, that's not what the practice guides are. It takes a lot more, it takes a lot more thought and understanding of where the organization needs to be or where the mm -hmm. team needs to be and, and why that is. And you're not going to complete something like this and you know, a short amount of time. It's a progressive thing. It's a continual improvement. You want to apply what you can, depending on the culture of the organization and the capabilities of the teams and mm -hmm. the budgets available, let it bake. Let it sit in the environment for a while, collect those improvement ideas. It's not something that you're going to start today and at, at, you know, at the end of the quarter be at, you know, a complete and final state. You know, that's not the intent of it as, you know, I, I don't want to, it, it might put it in more of a negative light saying that, but in terms of standing up a lot of these practices, it's more than just the practice in and of itself. There's a larger perspective that needs to be gathered. And so, you know, if, if you can understand why this practice is necessary and then start to extrapolate from there, that's very helpful. And, and that's where I think a lot of the guides lead. It's not going to give you, it's not going to give you, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this, but it's going to at least get you thinking and start having the discussions needed to, to make progress in that front. I think if you just remember, you know, again, start where you are and, and understand your why, you know, why do you want change? You know, what do you do today that's considered change and why do you want to do different and just start documenting those 
processes as they are. And from there, let's say, you know, even um, your Windows patching updates, right? That's a change. Document how you do it today and identify areas of improvement and grow from there. But it's just starting. You just have to start with documenting one thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's not yeah, again, it's not prescriptive. It's not, you have to do this thing first. Once you know how a server comes into the environment, you know, then you can do software, then you can do config. No, it's pick anything that you do and right. document it and right. find ways to improve and then grow as right. needed for your company. And right. Mario's question, I, I do get... I, can, I hear it a lot of times, you know, it's it's that, okay, I don't want the theoretical, but at some mm -hmm. point, the theoretical portion of this has to be discussed because I can't take templates that I've used for different different uh, consulting engagements and apply them to others. Maybe I could use bits and pieces of it, but mm -hmm. I, it's so different in each environment that I go into that you have to start from the why perspective of understanding What's the aspiration of what you're trying to do? What's the aspiration of what the organization's trying to do? That vision of mm -hmm. where they need to go. Once you start understanding that, then you can start having those discussions. And that's why I think the practice guides, they follow the four dimensions because it gives you that overall focus. You're not just dealing with the practice of, or maybe just information and technology. There is a people and org component or with supplier, there's a supplier and partner component. You know, and there's obviously the value stream and processes that have to be that have to be thought about. Are you going to tackle all those at once? No way. Mm -hmm. That's that's not going to happen, and that never right. happens. And I think that's where some of the older thinking, the historical thinking of version three ITIL, mm -hmm. was the concept of the life cycle, where you had to go through everything, and a lot of companies failed at that, and that mm -hmm. set up the precedent that well, I don't need ITIL because you know it's either theoretical and I don't know how to implement, or when I do try to implement, the teams are failing because they're trying to hit so many different things of all the different mm -hmm. service management life cycle that it's not meant for that. And so, right. you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing where, you know, you're not going to be able to get, you know, from A to B a lot of times very quickly, because there's a lot of consideration that has to happen of standing up these practices. Right. Well, you gave me a great segue. We've got three minutes left. So I'm mm -hmm. going to ask my last question. You know, we've been talking about these practice guides, but there are skills that you need in order to leverage these practice guides. So MJ, I'm going to start with you. What's the skill set that people need to build up in order to be able to not only leverage the practices, but, you know, help their organizations be successful using the practices? Hmm. Curiosity. <laughs> That's awesome. Actually, curiosity, too you know, learn something new and want to try, want to give it a shot in a different environment because, okay, we have learned many things throughout the years. We, we have our own heuristics, how, how we work, etc. those mental models. But sometimes, well, it's, it's good to learn something new. So, yeah, mm -hmm. curiosity. I love that. I'm an educator, so anytime it's about learning or curiosity um, makes me happy. Ryan, Robin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, for me, Donna, it's it's think larger picture than IT. This is not a compliance framework where you have, like I keep saying, you don't have to go through start to finish. There's a larger perspective of understanding opportunity and demand, how it's going to go through the organization, through all your value streams, and then ultimately getting to the point where is value delivered as an outcome? And you have to have that thinking you have to have that skill set to start using the guides because you can't you can't get so you can't get so um focused on you know different areas i i think you need to as part of the program or project to stand up some of the stuff for instance if you are dealing with information and technology and you want to get into metrics okay that deep dive is necessary you can double click mm -hmm. on that area and do what you need to do but from that larger perspective of where a person needs to be, get out of IT, guys. Think about the organization. Think about the value streams coming in. You have obviously have some opportunity or demand that the organization is identifying, but when that comes into the organization, how are we managing it? What value streams are we using? Are we doing any type of mapping or is there governance set? 
you know, we, we have these tools, we have these reference models, especially throughout ITIL 4, we have four dimensions, our service value system, our service mm -hmm. value chain. We have value stream mapping that is talked about, you know, to some point. And then also, if you don't know where to start, guys, continual improvement. Start right. there. Right. And you, like, you led your, one of your very first comments was organizational change management, right, which is always an aspect of continual improvement. Robin, we're going to let you wrap. What other skills do you think you need? Open-mindedness, yeah. <laughs> flexibility, and um, always keeping your eye on the why is the yep. biggest thing. The why mm -hmm. and and who your customers are, who you, who your stakeholders are, what they want, right. and you know instead of instead of always thinking I have to do these things, I have to follow this list. Right. It, it really is, um, you know, you you. You implement what you need and yes. only as much as your company needs. Yes. Adaptability. And I would add in process design and improvement, value stream mapping, a strong skill set to need to do. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, panelists. Uh, you know, I had a great time. Um, Aaron, you have a very specific question, and I'll reach out to you offline, and uh, I'll be happy to offer you up a question. So thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.